Hey everyone, so I don't think it's very controversial to say that one of the key areas where the Souls franchise has often struggled over the years is with their final bosses. As fantastic as these games are with their area design, their enemy encounters and their mid-game bosses, FromSoft has always struggled with putting satisfying and challenging encounters at the end of their games outside of a couple of instances. So what I thought I would do in this video is rank each of the final bosses across the Soulsborne, Sekiro and Elden Ring series, talk about each of them, give you the positives as well as the negatives, and yeah, have a proper ranking set up at the end. And you know, for this ranking, I'm not just going to consider the actual mechanics of the fight, I am going to take things like the story and the theming of the boss into account as well. However, of course, at the end of the day, the gameplay is going to be the key. And finally, in terms of considering what is actually a proper final boss, I'm going to count the last encounter in each of the games. However, considering that there are gauntlets of bosses and multi-phase bosses, the simple rule is if in between the boss phases you can go out, you can die, you can do other things and you don't have to refight each phase, then I'm only going to consider the last phase because those are separate bosses. However, even if there are two enemies with two separate HP bars but you have to fight them together, they're going to be counted as one boss. Really, that's I think the fairest way of counting every single one of these encounters and giving the proper final boss of each game a chance. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the list starting in last place. Number 8 is going to be King Alond from Demon's Souls. Now this of course is 100% a thematic boss. King Alant is not meant to be an actual challenge. Still, he is the final boss of Demon Souls and as a fight, he is basically nothing. First of all, King Alant absolutely cannot hurt you. You have to actively try to die against him. He has very slow attacks, very low damage and yeah, unless you're literally standing still and letting him hit you, you are never going to die to this enemy. But even then, going beyond the fact that he's nothing gameplay wise, I find King Alant to be visually uninteresting as well, and especially compared to what everyone thinks is the true final boss of the game, the False King, he is incredibly underwhelming. He also doesn't even add that much to the story, he just kind of shows up out of nowhere, you whack him around and he dies. Honestly, not much more to say about him. He is the last on this ranking for a reason. He's in the game for story reasons and nothing more. His gameplay is basically zero. All right, number seven on our list is going to be Nashandra from Dark Souls 2. Okay, so maybe I'm cheating a little bit because I will be including both versions of Dark Souls 2. But my thought process is that for a long time until Scholar of the First Thing came out, Nishandra was the final boss of Dark Souls 2, so I thought it's only fair that we count her as well, especially since I do have quite a few things to say about Nishandra. Now first of all, I do not have a problem with her design. A lot of people say that she's incredibly generic, she's a basic like Grim Reaper lookalike, but honestly, I kind of think she's cool. I like how alien-ish she looks, and I mean alien from the movie Alien. And honestly, I think her voice is especially well done. She has kind of a creepy thing going. Unfortunately, as a fight, she is incredibly underwhelming. One of the most boring final bosses in this entire franchise, aside from the previously mentioned King Galant. Her moves are extremely basic and are very heavily telegraphed. And even though she deals a lot of damage, again, in terms of just her actual attacks, you have to make very careless mistakes or actively try to get killed by her. Even if you fight her together with the Throne Watcher and the Defender and you're low on Estus, even then it doesn't matter too much. It doesn't have the same impact as some of the other multi-phase boss fights have. Plus, of course, Dark Souls 2 has life gems which can completely bypass this. However, there is of course one gimmick when it comes to Nishandra, her stupid curse orbs. This is one of the most baffling mechanics included for a Souls final boss. Essentially, it is an incredibly heavy and incredibly annoying health drain. And 
it just provides a cheap challenge. This doesn't make Nashandra in any ways interesting as a final boss. All it does is it makes you have to roll through some annoying orbs with really weak hitboxes and just remove the curse and the health train. Again, it's the cheapest form of challenge. Instead of having a boss with a proper difficult moveset, just throw in some curse orbs and that's it. And of course, I think FromSoft realized that they made a mistake because DLC number 2 for Dark Souls 2 has an item, I think it's called the Hollow Skin, which completely bypasses this mechanic by giving you infinite curse resist, making her even easier. Honestly, Nashandra is really boring and underwhelming and one of the worst final bosses out there. Next up, number 6 on our list is going to be the Moon Presence from Bloodborne. I think it's such a shame that the Moon Presence exists, because if it didn't exist, Bloodborne would be at or near the top of this list, because in my opinion, German is one of the best Souls bosses period, and it's one of my personal favorite bosses. But no, this thing unfortunately exists to ruin the fun. It's kind of a common theme with all these bad final bosses, that they happen to be incredibly easy, and the Moon Presence doesn't bug this trend at all. He is different to almost any other Bloodborne boss in that he is both pretty slow and has telegraphed attacks and doesn't deal a lot of damage. Usually Bloodborne bosses either tend to be incredibly quick or do a ton of damage or in some cases like Orphan of Cause combine both. Well, Moon Presence doesn't have either factor. Again, with the previous entries, you kind of have to be very careless to die to him. He's not on the same level as King Galant or even Nashandra in my opinion because he can kill you but again you have to be very careless to die to him. Really the one mechanic which has even the slightest potential to kill you is that health drain move which takes you down to 1 HP but again you can use the rally system against that very easily especially since he stands still for like 30 seconds afterwards essentially allowing you to regain all of your HP. Honestly, if he didn't have that, he would still be very easy and most of the challenge would be a gimmick because he would just drain you for 1 HP and then accidentally hit you. But the fact that he stands still for so long, allowing you to regain 90% of the damage he deals, completely invalidates any challenge the Moon Presence might have. Honestly, the only couple of points the Moon Presence gets is his looks and thematics. I think he's visually very interesting and cool, but gameplay wise, especially for a secret final boss, because you really do have to work to get to the Moon Presence, I honestly really would have expected a little bit more. Alright, number 5 on our list is going to be Aldia from Dark Souls 2's Color of the First Sin. To be honest with you, I really had a difficult time placing Aldia versus the Moon Presence. I went back and forth with the list on who to put where, and at the end I realized that to me these two are basically on the same rung of the shittiness ladder, so essentially take this and the previous entry as completely interchangeable. Aldia at least bucks the trend of the previous bosses in that he can actually kill you. He does do quite a lot of damage, but again, his attacks are incredibly slow and are fairly easy to dodge. Aldia is another gimmick fight, in that you can only attack him when he does a teleport move, or does one of those big fire explosions that removes the fire from around him. If you try to attack him at any other point, you will take quite a lot of damage if you stand close to him, and his defenses will be so high that you will essentially be dealing zero damage to him. Now, you guys know, I'm not necessarily against gimmick fights, but man did From screw up, because holy hell this boss is boring. This is like easily a 7-8 to eight minute fight, where most of the time you're just sitting around waiting for him to do one of the two moves that removes the fire and then you have a chance to go in for like a couple of hits yourself. In terms of being an actual challenge, the only danger to you comes from just how boring this fight is because you might just fall asleep and not notice and get hit by one of his pretty high damaging attacks. Also, I will admit, even though I count them separately, but if you do the whole gauntlet of Throne Watcher, Nashandra 
and Aldia. By the time you get to him, it can be fairly difficult, but judged as a fight just on its own, there is almost nothing. Yeah, you are absolutely gonna be half asleep by the end of this fight. Sure, there is at least some danger here, so I do give him a little bit more credit, but man, Compared to how great the DLC and bosses are in Dark Souls 2, this guy is just a massive and annoying letdown. It's a shame too because I enjoy Aldia as a character and I do think he's a good addition to Scholar of the First Sin's story and lore and I do like his voice acting, but yeah, he did not need to be a boss at the end. Number 4 on our list, we are going to talk about the most recent From game to come out, that is of course Elden Ring. And number 4 on the list is of course Radagon slash the Elden Beast. Now that we're at the midpoint of this list, how fitting is it that Elden Ring gets this placement because, to me personally, Radagon and the Elden Beast are the yin yang final boss fight of this franchise. Essentially what I mean by that is I really truly enjoy Radagon's fight. In general, you guys are probably aware that I have my fair share of problems with the Elden Ring endgame bosses, but there are a couple of highlights and Radagon in my opinion is one of them and he is a fantastic fight. First of all, he looks really striking visually. I think his design has been absolutely nailed by FromSoft. And for the fight in general, I love the fact that the Elden Ring main theme is playing. I think it really gives the fight an epic sense and urgency. And besides that, Radagon is also a fun fight. His moves make sense. One of my issues with many of the Elden Ring endgame bosses is that they are so aggressive and attack so much and have such huge hitboxes that it's difficult to even judge when to dodge, how to dodge and when you can get in one or two hits as a counter attack. Radagon is absolutely not like that. There is a very clear and understandable flow that you can get into. Sure he does have a lot of combos, sure he does have a lot of staggers and a lot of delays, but again once you have the fight down, everything is clearly telegraphed and understandable. He provides plenty of challenge while never feeling unfair. In fact, when you get good at this fight, it can be very exhilarating. Something a final Souls boss should provide. It's really satisfying to dodge all of his moves, get those perfect counterattacks and stagger him, while also at the same time being in constant danger because he can end you in a couple of hits. Unfortunately, when it comes to Radagon, any positives I can name for him are completely thrown out the window with the Elden Beast. Elden Beast is lucky, because if it wasn't together with Radagon, it would be near the very back of this list. I think Elden Beast is a summary of probably the biggest issues I have with Elden Ring. That is the bloat, the lack of restraint, the lack of when to stop. Elden Beast encapsulates all of that perfectly. He comes after a very challenging fight, and instead of being a gimmick or being a thematic fight, he is a giant monster with awful camera, extreme damage, wonky attacks and an absolutely bloated HP pool. Even alone this guy would be frustrating, he runs away 90% of the time, again the camera doesn't work, there are a ton of moves that can cut you off guard. Elden Star's that move in my opinion is still absolutely bullshit and again just the fact that you're running across this big empty arena 90% of the time without torrent is very frustrating. To this day I still wholeheartedly subscribe to that conspiracy theory that you were meant to have torrent here and from just forgot to add him or turn him on and now they're too embarrassed to correct it. The fact that FromSoft packaged this guy after Radagon is ridiculous because he isn't interesting visually, comes out of nowhere and ruins a fight that I actually enjoy a lot. And that in my view is the worst sin you can commit. There was zero reason for Elden Beast to be in the game. There's barely any foreshadowing to him in the story itself, he just kind of shows up. And with him being this bloated and this awful, it really does bring the whole experience down for Elden Ring. At number 3 on our list, moving on, we have Gwyn, Lord of Cinder from Dark Souls 1. As we come to Gwyn, I don't know if there is anything that hasn't been said about this guy, 
Of course, Dark Souls has been out for 11 years at this point, so I think most of the points around Gwyn have already been covered. Gwyn gets many, many theme points. In that sense, if we were just counting thematics alone, he is the perfect Dark Souls end boss. Unfortunately, gameplay-wise, Gwyn is a mixed bag. Firstly, parrying. As we all know, he is 100% invalidated by parrying, becoming an incredible pushover once you figure out how to parry his moves and what to dodge and how to use a parrying dagger or buckler basically. On the other hand though, fighting Gwyn quote-unquote fairly can actually be very frustrating. He seems to not play by the rules of the game in that he feels about 25% faster than you could ever be, he is incredibly aggressive and he does tons of damage. Still, I can't say it's all bad. Honestly, with a good fire protection shield or a great shield, or even a normal shield with strong magic shield cast on it, can be used to fight against him. So I can't say that there are no other playstyles that could work against him other than parrying, but even then he is incredibly fast and difficult to deal with. I'm gonna be 100% with you, I'm kind of torn on Gwyn and always have been. On the one hand, you would be absolutely stupid not to fight him with parries, but still, it always kind of feels like I'm ruining a good challenge in some ways. However, if I do try to fight him fairly, most of the times I end up leaving frustrated. Gwyn is honestly lucky that everything else, his looks, the music, the arena are 100% on point, because that is what saves this fight and earns it such a high ranking. Moving on to number 2 on our list, we have the Soul of Cinder from Dark Souls 3. We've officially reached the two From final bosses that I actually think are fantastic fights, and honestly, I think these two shouldn't be surprises, as the community widely considers these two to be the best most of the time. Soul of Cinder, like Gwen, is on point thematically. Dark Souls 3 is supposed to be the love letter to the Dark Souls franchise, and I think it's very appropriate that he essentially represents all of the various playstyles from across all of the games you could have. It's good that he also happens to be very fun. You have to adapt to his four modes, and all of them bring different challenges and different tactics on your end. He deals a lot of damage of course, he is aggressive, but it never feels unfair. All playstyles are valid and work against him, and just like how you can switch up your playstyle against him, he is going to be switching it up against you as well. I think conceptually Soul of Cinder is just very cool. And of course, there's Phase 2. I think this is one of the best Phase 2s to any of us out there. The theme when you get to the second phase is one of the best, playing and sort of reworking the Gwyn theme. And honestly, it's great to see and fight a souped up version of Gwyn and imagine what he would have been capable of in his prime. The second phase of Soul of Cinder also manages to fix many of the problems with Gwyn itself. First of all, he is not parryable, but at the same time, his moves are a lot more restrained and a lot easier to dodge. This is very fitting for a second phase boss, especially a second phase boss that essentially gets a whole new complete HP bar. This boss understands that two HP bar bosses shouldn't go overboard, <clears throat> I'm looking at you Elden Ring, and the second phase should be challenging but not impossible, even if you lost quite a lot of Estus in phase 1. If you're good at the game and you have a decent rundown of his moves, he's beatable in almost any circumstance once you get to him. This guy and the next entry really are the gold standards, and it's a shame that From can only capture the magic of a fantastic final boss so rarely, because it really is magic when it occurs. And we finally get to number one, in my opinion, the best final boss in the Soulsborne franchise is Genichiro slash Ishin the Sword Saint from Sekiro. In my opinion, Ishin, I'm just going to refer to them as Ishin, is the pinnacle of From boss design and the pinnacle of what a great final boss can be. 
Weirdly, when looking back at the entries in this list, I sometimes get the feeling that for some reason From doesn't want to make the final bosses in their games the biggest challenge. The only two games that really differ from this are Elden Ring, although it can be argued that Melania is way harder, and of course Sekiro. In Sekiro, Ishin is the ultimate test. Now you can argue whether him or the Demon of Hatred are more difficult. Honestly, after fighting both multiple times, I think Ishin is way more challenging. He is the ultimate test of whether you've learned and understood Sekiro's mechanics. He will absolutely test every single skill you have, from your deflection, your skill use, the parrying, the dodging, all the perilous attack moves, everything is gonna have to be used against Ishin. So in that way, thematically, he's very fitting. With Genichiro in combination, you have a satisfying start because you get to see your power scaling by essentially destroying Genichiro, but then you also have three phases of Ishin to deal with. Each phase of Ishin brings a completely new set of challenges and it progressively gets more and more challenging. At the same time though, Ishin is 100% fair. He never does any move that is bullshit, or cannot be avoided or cannot be countered. Everything is clear about him. You know when to counter, you know what to do against his attacks, and it's very understandable when you have your openings. And like I said, at the same time, this doesn't make him a pushover. He is easily the most difficult Sekiro fight, and getting everything to work correctly to the point that you can defeat him does take a lot of skill. He does the right amount of damage, but he also takes the right amount of damage. You don't feel like you are against insurmountable odds, you just have to play near flawlessly. He is absolutely the culmination of your journey and your final test, making him my favorite fight not only in Sekiro, but my favorite from Final Boss as well. He really is the gold standard and as we go on with the franchise I think it's going to be very difficult to ever top the challenge that Ishin the Sword Saint can offer. And with that I think I'm gonna go ahead and slowly start wrapping up this list. Hope you guys enjoyed this worst to best ranking of the Souls final bosses. I hope I made my points clear and you kind of have an overview of why I think each boss should go where. But of course, as always, I'm open to different opinions, so feel free to let me know what you think of each of these bosses. And also give me your ranking in the comments sections because I'm really interested to see what you guys think. Cool, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe and turn on post notifications as usual. And yeah, I hope to catch all of you guys next time on my other videos as well. Thanks for watching and peace out.